Written questions will be asked as time permits, and you may use the forms on your table. Please hold them up so the staff can collect them. City Club's program committee tries to give us topics that are timely. Today's program on developing Portland's East Bank is both timely and timeless. Timely in that a Citizens Advisory Committee just recommended to Portland City Council that the section of I-5 between the Markham Bridge and I-84 be removed sometime in the next two years, and the uh, City Council is scheduled to respond next week. And timeless because this issue, or some form of it, has been debated off and on for decades. The proposal has had new life breathed into it by City Commissioner Charlie Hales. Elected to City Council just one year ago, Commissioner Hales brings to the position a history of citizen involvement as well as professional experience in housing policy and land use planning. Will you join me in welcoming to the podium fellow City Club member Charlie Hales. Thank you, Madam President, fellow members, friends. Let me start by telling you a story, a story about a city. Imagine a city founded on one side of a river. The city was begun there because the ground was higher and drier, and the deeper water allowed ships to approach the docks and buildings which soon sprang up there. The city grew, though, and like most American cities, it followed an emerging pattern. Outside of a small central area, the growth and the shape of the city was determined not by planning, but by where the roads and the streetcars ran. It grew to encompass both of the river's banks and great swaths of land on both sides. Then the automobile arrived. And like Americans everywhere, the people who lived in this city were infatuated with cars. So infatuated that they turned their backs on the river, dirtied it, and used, it, the, used the riverfront land on both sides of it as a convenient roadbed. Then they realized their mistake. They were bold in that realization and activist in their response to this and other challenges to the health of their city. They tore out one of the two freeways they had so short-sightedly built there. They took two downtown streets and made them into a transit mall. And listen to this crazy idea. They actually demolished an old parking garage and built a public square. Each time they did this, there were those who feared the change, those who just could not see the point, those who thought that the future would and should be just a continuation of the present. This story is ours. This is why we are here. This is why our city council is once again faced with the choice of muddling through or facing the mistake and reaching out to a different future, reaching out to a vision of what should be, and if we are determined enough, what will be. That is what we asked a committee of citizens to help us do. I'm pleased that many of them are here with you today. The process of appointing this committee and asking them to reconsider the East Bank was precipitated by two urgent requests, two requests that seemed to conflict with one another and which raised again the larger question of how much longer we could work around this mistake of a freeway on our waterfront. One was a brave effort to design a park in the narrow strip of land between the freeway and the water's edge, an attempt to make something livable out of a hostile place. The other was a request for final city approval of the construction of the Water Avenue ramp, another addition to I-5, and one which had acquired great symbolic value for some of the property owners along it and nearby. With a proposed cost of some $20 million, this ramp would take about six years to complete and would stand as yet another concrete megastructure looming over the riverbank. But some east side business people say that it is vital to their future. As we looked at these two issues, we were frustrated by a growing realization that too often our council and most public bodies makes decisions like this in isolation, not holistically. We might approve a land use plan here, a combined sewer overflow project there, a transportation project somewhere else, with little coordination or integration of these different agendas and public works. So we asked this committee 
to examine in one forum all of the planning and public works efforts that, had, that were underway in the East Bank and to craft for them a single coherent vision for this area. Now, this was not a new undertaking. Other citizens had met in years past and had looked at the East Bank's future. A city club committee in 1980 produced a report on a vision for Portland's future. That report contains seven major elements, and here are the first two. Number one, development of the Willamette River as both a working river and an attraction with residential, commercial, retail, service, and recreational uses along public promenades flanking its banks with ample docking facilities for industrial, commercial, commuter, as well as recreational purposes. Number two, redevelopment of the Near East Side, bounded by the River, Powell, Southeast 12th, and the Northeast Broadway, with a shift in emphasis over a period of time from exclusively industrial and commercial use to a mixed use of residential, industrial, commercial, retail, and services, including Produce Row and other distributive services, and the eventual joining of this area with the West Side Central Business District. And the Central City Plan, a massive planning effort in the late 1980s, said this, enhance the Willamette River as the focal point for views, public activities, and development which knits the city together. But this latest committee has taken one step more than either the City Club Committee or the Central City Plan. They looked at all these visions and all the plans and the policies that the city has directed at the East Bank. They reconsidered and reconfirmed those visions and elaborated on them. They looked at what is already changing there with the influence of OMSI and the Convention Center and the new Oregon Arena Complex. And they faced squarely the fact that these visions cannot be achieved with the freeway where it is. Here are their main ideas. First, seize the opportunity to achieve the full and unique potential of the Willamette River East Bank, especially the river's edge, in order to best serve the neighborhoods, the city, and the region. Two, develop a land use plan for the area, which redefines it from simply an industrial area to an opportunity area, capitalizing on the attractors now there or taking shape, OMSI, the convention center, and the arena complex. Third, maintain an industrial sanctuary east of First Avenue, providing family wage jobs in close proximity to city neighborhoods and in, in a supportive relationship with downtown. Fourth, plan jointly for the city's massive combined sewer overflow project and any park or redevelopment plan for the East Bank before proceeding with construction of either one. And finally, over the long term, reroute I-5 through traffic so that there is no longer an interstate freeway passing through the East Bank. Create instead an integrated transportation corridor, which serves not only motor vehicles, but also transit and bicycle and pedestrian travel. Now as to this last recommendation, was this committee simply a, a bunch of foolish visionaries when it comes to transportation? What's this stuff about an integrated transportation corridor and how are we supposed to pay for that? First, let's deal with the persistent smokescreen that the most economical approach is to keep the freeway where it is. In the hands of a state transportation agency, at least one like ours has been until the very recent past, a freeway is not a completed public work. It's a loss leader, a work in progress, the beginning of a cycle of building a limited access motorway to move traffic, and once it fills up or starts to have a lot of accidents, building more lanes and ramps. These projects are still called improvements. Our committee discovered something unsettling here, and that is after 20 years of land use planning in this state, we're still making those assumptions. We've had plenty of evidence that in the automobile age, putting transportation first and land use second is a bad deal for everyone but those with a vested interest in freeways. We have new state and federal policy designed to move us away from that build your way out of congestion paradigm and we have new visionary leadership on the Oregon Transportation Commission and in that department, who I believe support the new paradigm of transportation as if communities mattered. But despite all that, the highway machine has still not been dismantled. We're still designing and years later, finally building mammoth structures to move more and more cars. This process grinds on independent of almost anything. After all, the Water Avenue ramp was proposed and sketched out in 1978. And the Water Avenue ramp is just the beginning. 
There are designs floating around for a $100 million worth of 10-lane California freeway in the neighborhood of the arena. And if they got the opportunity, there are some local decision makers who would spend another $70 million to build more ramps connecting I-5 to McLaughlin. Add it up. That's more than $200 million in this short stretch of freeway just to keep it working a little longer. Let's make it clear. The expensive choice when it comes to freeways is the status quo. The choice is not then being practical and economical and leaving the freeway where it is. That has been and will continue to be an expensive money pit. The choice is, do we keep adding to urban freeways or do we start putting our money where our mouth is and start putting those more enlightened policies into action? The choice is also whether we design our transportation system to serve our community or fit our community around a transportation monolith like we've done on the East Bank. And that choice involves much more than cost. It's one of real contrast in terms of what we get for our money. Here's how James Kunstler described that choice in his book, The Geography of Nowhere. The deficiencies of the American freeway system are immediately apparent. It's designed solely from the vantage of the traffic engineer. It is monofunctional. Its only purpose is to move cars. No other activity can go on at its margins. It does not respect the presence of humans without automobiles. The freeway is not part of the urban fabric. Rather, it is superimposed upon it. When it defines urban spaces, it does so in only a crude and disruptive way, creating Chinese walls of noise, danger, and gloom that cut off neighborhoods from each other. Now consider a boulevard in Paris, he says. In the center of the boulevard are several express lanes for fast-moving traffic. At each side of the express lane is a median island planted with trees. These medians an outer, define an outer slow lane on each side of the boulevard for drivers looking for a local address. There's space for parking along both sides of the median island and along the sidewalk. Finally, the outer edges of the sidewalks are planted with formal orderly rows of trees. In other words, you have a 12-lane road in which half the lanes are used for parking and the rest for moving cars at two different speeds, express and local. Thus, the boulevard is part of the urban fabric of the city. It celebrates the idea of the city as a place with value, a place where a human being would want to be, not just a one-dimensional office slum to be fled after the hours of work. It defines space in a way that allows for multiple functions, motoring, strolling, shopping, business, apartment living, repose. The subtleties of its design make all the difference. Imagine walking along that boulevard. Now imagine sitting at a little round table in the breakdown way, lane of the freeway at 5.30 in the afternoon. That kind of boulevard that he describes, with the added ingredients of transit and perhaps a high-speed rail terminal, is what we mean by an integrated transportation corridor, granted an inelegant label for an elegant idea. A real multi-purpose boulevard instead of a cartoon freeway. That is the kind of transportation future the Central East Side could have and I think that investment will serve OMSI, the convention center, and the arena a lot better than $200 million dumped into the same old freeway. But in order to get there, we must first turn away from the transportation past, from this old paradigm of ever-expanding systems of freeways struggling to accommodate ever-rising automobile traffic. We must begin that change somewhere. And I believe that the place to start is on the east side half of the heart of our city and that the time to start is now. And although I agree with our committee on every other point, I respectfully disagree with the majority of that committee which voted seven to six that we go ahead and build the Water Avenue ramp. If we know that the freeway is incompatible with the highest and best use of this area, then the Water Avenue ramp will be a step backwards. As Chris Olson Rogers, one member of our committee put it, it would be a monument to the lords of yesterday. So that's why I have this morning filed a resolution instructing the State Department of Transportation not to proceed with the Water Avenue ramp. Now what will happen if this resolution passes next Wednesday morning? First, it will put to an end the ramp itself. With all of these changes afoot in transportation philosophy, this dinosaur will be gone for good. And unlike Jurassic Park, it won't be cloned to come back at us. The funds which were committed to that will then be on the table 
That will open up the opportunity to fund other transportation, process, uh, other transportation improvements in the Central East Side, which really are improvements, to start on some of the very ideas that this committee has proposed. But something even more significant might happen. If we, the leaders of this city, in effect, volunteer to shift some of our share of regional highway dollars to a different transportation future we all say that we want to reach, then maybe some other local governments in the region will come with us. So this first decisive step here in Portland could start something bigger in the whole metropolitan area. I know of no better way to lead than by example. If we back up our visions with our actions, we'll achieve something of lasting value on the East Bank and beyond. Now, I understand the personal risk here, but when I was here in this room last, in the heat of my campaign, I told you that I would work for a livable Portland and take the long view. And I believe that what I'm proposing here today makes good on that commitment. So imagine a city, a great city, the heart of which spans the river which once divided it. Imagine a great boulevard running north and south through the central east side, connecting the area to I-5, to the Banfield, to McLaughlin. And McLaughlin, by the way, is still a boulevard, not surreptitiously converted to a freeway. On one side of that boulevard, imagine the blocks along the river itself being a real connection, not just a ribbon of afterthought. Imagine those blocks as a mixture of parks and commerce, inviting travel between the arena complex, a booming convention center, and a major hotel on the north end, and OMSI, and a community college, and a farmer's market on the south end. Imagine a healthy employment zone along the other side. Oh yes, it's still there. After all, even with the freeway gone and a new boulevard in place, the Central East Side Industrial Sanctuary covers more than 250 blocks, from 1st to 12th, from Powell to the Banfield Freeway. Yes, that's still there too. This sanctuary is a big, robust place. It has the three advantages of excellent location, good transportation, and access to the river and the attractions along it. It competes effectively with generic suburban industrial parks with their artificial ponds, high lease rates, and traffic congestion. Imagine working in that district, not an office building. Those are concentrated in West Downtown in the Lloyd District, but in a thriving business that makes things or fixes things or delivers things. Imagine being able to commute to your job there in that industrial district by light rail or bus or streetcar, being able to walk to the river after work, or, if you wanted to, to ride your bike on a bikeway which runs past Omsey, through Oaks Bottom and Selwood and all the way to Gresham. This isn't a dream, people. Portland and Gresham and Metro have the funds today to build this trail. We're just not quite sure yet how to get it through the mess on the East Bank. So imagine thinking of your city not as divided by a river, but united by it and by a lively mixture of private prosperity and public space along both sides of it. Imagine taking your children or your grandchildren down to the river to watch the sunset paint big pink and throw shadows out onto the water and telling them, you know, there used to be a freeway right here but this is Portland. Thank you. To begin the round of questionings, we'll invite Andrew Wheeler, and then Andrew Waite, and then others. Please come to the microphones. I, like a lot of people here, I suspect are disarmed. I, I, I didn't expect anything so wonderful. Um, Commissioner Hales, uh, architects and planners uh, and some visionaries regained hope when you and Mayor Katz came on board to share with Mike Lindbergh your reluctance to give up on visions for the East Side. You, Commissioner, and your task force have worked through months of hearings, thinking, and writing, trying to decide what's for the greater good. I would like it if any members of the task force are here could stand up and be recognized. <laughs> you, 
You have heard the classic debate. One side saying, not in our backyard. We have some projects on hold in our industrial sanctuary, and the bulk, the bulk of it actually, as you just heard, is elsewhere. And further, we want a driveway from Interstate 5 to service. I think of this, I thought of the same word, as the Jurassic Park option, institutionalizing a mistake. A great city wouldn't do that. Perhaps the compromise from the task force that, that keeps the sanctuary certainly where it is, uh, is good, but I certainly agree with Commissioner Hales that the, the ramp uh, should not be there. And furthermore, the Ross Island Bridge, I would suspect, would, would uh, be revised. The other side would give the people uh, the river. Y you have heard planners unanimous say that this 42 acres between OMSI and the Trailblazers Arena, uh, Glickman's permitting, is an opportunity to add to the resource space in a significant way to develop places for people to live and work and recreate. Uh, when can we start the project? <laughs> well, we can start the project uh, now with this decision next week. And, and I don't mean that f facetiously. Um, you know, the, the journey of many miles begins with a single step. And this is that single step. And the mayor who is here with us today and my colleague, Commissioner Kafuri, and the other members of the city council will have the opportunity uh, Wednesday to make that first step. And, and there's much of this committee's recommendations that will require further decisions by the council uh, and, and further expenditures of time and effort and commitment. What we have done in this resolution is just take the most immediate decision, which is should we or should we not build the Water Avenue ramp? The state needs to know, and if, they, if we say no, we need to figure out how to redistribute the funds in the region. That set of transportation decisions needs to come now. There are other recommendations, such as a, uh, a, an update of the Central City Plan, a comprehensive transportation study of the east side that would move us towards this new paradigm that will take years, months of work in some cases, uh, both in the planning and the implementation steps. But what this committee has done is given us a coherent vision of what that area ought to be and how it ought to function and nailed down this principle that land use comes first and transportation and other infrastructure comes second. Now, the project was actually supported by a loaned executive from the Water Bureau, Jeannie McKeever, and she was a great help to us, and she didn't, she didn't plant this concept, but it occurred to us in the course of the process. Would we let a water provider or a sewer provider determine the pattern of, of, of urban form? Well, of course not. They're just infrastructure. So why would we let roads determine the pattern of urban form? The pattern of urban form ought to be determined by planning and then the road system built to serve that. And again, there are plenty of people in the Oregon Transportation Commission at Metro and, and in the state agencies that are involved who understand that and who believe that now and who are ready to move away from the build your way out of congestion model. But the political leadership here in the city and in the region has to be willing to put our money where our mouth is. So part of the answer to your question is watch how we budget. Watch how we budget for planning. Watch how the region budgets for transportation. And, and like they said in Watergate, follow the money. <laughs> Commissioner Hales, Harold Wade of the Land Use and Transportation Committee. In uh, our post-Measure 5 environment, funding for local governments is likely to be tight for some time to come. Um, we saw what happened to the funding for the Oregon Transportation Plan in this last legislative session. And the feds have uh, indicated that they expect us to do more with less in the future. With all of that in mind, what would make us think that funding for moving or removing the freeway will be any more available in the future, whether we're looking a few years or 20 or 30 years down the road? In other words, where's the money going to come from to do this? Good point. Remember first that even though the legislature didn't, improve, it didn't approve an increase in the gas tax, there is still an enormous revenue flow of the gas tax to the transportation system. Most of that revenue is now directed at road projects. Again, there are plenty of people who want to, to accelerate this shift 
to a, a broader and more diverse transportation system. There are some limitations in the Constitution and elsewhere that prevent us from doing that as fully as we'd like. But the new federal legislation, this awful acronym of ICE-T, the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act, uh, and other policy changes uh, give us much more flexibility in moving these resources around. I think we should go back to the legislature and ask them once again to increase the gas tax so that we can make these changes happen. If you're going to build your way out of congestion, why not tax congestion, i.e. the automobile, to accomplish that? In fact, there's another resource that's been left laying on the table for years and I think is unknown to a lot of people. The TriMet board has the ability to impose a gas tax. It's never been used. Um, that resource is yet untapped and um, is, is there, at least in theory, available to start funding these ideas. So the transportation dollars that we have, maybe there aren't as many of them as we would like, but they still spend tens of millions of dollars a year in the Portland area on road projects. That pool is now more flexible in how we direct it, and I think this is a place to start. Ted Kay, City Club member. Charlie. This situation seems to mirror in some ways San Francisco's experience. It had the Embarcadero Expressway ringing its bayfront, blocking the views of the bay from the downtown, and uh, people argued for years whether it should come down. Specifically, the Chinatown and, and downtown merchants were saying, we won't get our access, people won't come. Of course, San Francisco had uh, an earthquake help it out, and uh, the Embarco Embarcadero Expressway's twin on the other side of the, the bay fell down, and they found out that, well, it's, it's going to cost too much to shore it up, so they took it down. They took it down very quickly, and that's the point of my question. If we proceed upon this course and get the political consensus to do so, how long would it take before we can get to the point to say, there used to be a freeway here? The short answer is that I don't know yet. The longer answer is the committee has recommended that this occur in a 20 to 25 year time frame. I think there are a few of us, including the members of the committee, that would, want, uh, that, would, that would turn down the opportunity to make it happen sooner. I think in, in all good planning and in fairness to the people in the Central East Side who have invested there, to make sure that we've got a good transportation serving the new arena, a new transportation system serving the new arena complex, we've got to make sure that the alternatives are underway and, and phased in a way that we don't create a transportation bottleneck as we make this change. No one has done this other than now San Francisco. Uh, so there has been uh, little path breaking in front of us, as often is the case here in Portland, uh, to show us how to do this. But it can be done. Uh, yeah, we had a designer earthquake back in March. Unfortunately, it wasn't really focused on one little spot. Uh, but, but we're not going to wait for that to happen, uh, nor are we going to count on some calamity to show us what I think common sense has revealed to all three of these groups and others who've looked at this area. So the sooner the better, but, but dollars are limited. That point is valid. And the Central East Side deserves a good transportation system during the transition as well as after. So we have to keep those principles in mind as we make that transition. I hope it's less than 25 years. I'd rather tell my children about that than my grandchildren, or tell them both, but to tell the children before grandchildren are around. Yes. Uh, Paul Milius, Business and Labor Committee member. Um, the, we've seen in the 15 years that I've lived in Portland, uh, and I guess the first one was I only heard about, uh, killing the Mount Hood Freeway, but which eventually led to the development of Powell Boulevard into uh, a, what seems to me to be a limited access urban boulevard, <clears throat> and also Yeon Avenue. Uh, if I've got the name right, I keep forgetting which of those streets it is, but the link from the freeway to Highway 30 uh, going out to Astoria. Uh, my two-part question, have these projects been successful in terms of handling the traffic flow, uh, avoiding a freeway link, and B, is this the kind of thing you envision for the east side, uh, and I guess probably third part, where would it go? To the first question, have those projects been successful? Um, only partly so. And from what I understand of the disciplines of urban design and planning and transportation planning, the details really matter. And as the author of the Geography of Nowhere said in describing that Paris Boulevard, the fit and the feel and the design of these, of these public spaces, roads included, that affect all of our private spaces is very important. Walk down a, a neighborhood street in Portland that has sidewalks and then walk down one that doesn't. The difference in fit 
and environment is very, very different. Uh, try to walk down one of the many arterial or collector streets in our city that we have classified as pedestrian or transit streets, but which don't have sidewalks, uh, and get to the bus stop. It's not a pleasant experience. The details matter. Uh, so I, while I don't think the design of Powell Boulevard is, is the model that we want to achieve, uh, we can learn from that mistake and from the, and from the successes and failure of that, of that particular roadway. The other thing that we have to do is, again, have the land use right and, and make sure that we don't create neighborhoods or business districts where so many trips have to be taken by automobile, because our population is going to grow. The sheer number of motor vehicles in the Portland metropolitan area is going to grow. The question is, how often do they have to be driven and how far do they have to be driven? If you have to use a quart of gasoline to get a quart of milk in your neighborhood, you don't have the right urban design yet. And we have to, at every level of land use planning, try to create a community that is not automobile dependent. The, the pinnacle of that problem is the freeway system. Finally, um, I'm sorry, Paul, the third part of your question was about, uh, was about the Powell Boulevard, and I've forgotten what it was. Do you see that as a model? And uh, for your east side idea, and where would you I'm sorry, where would, where would we put it? Um, it? It could be MLK Grand. It could be in an area uh, near, the, like, the, near the existing Southern Pacific Rail Alignment, which was discussed as one of the options for a location of a relocated freeway. And one of the things that the committee um, restrained themselves from doing, which I as a policymaker, and I think the rest of the city council feels the same way, uh, need to restrain ourselves from doing, is attempt to impersonate transportation planners, architects, and urban designers. I think we should give some general policy direction to these folks and, and then make the tough judgments when we see the proposals, but not attempt to sketch these things out on our own uh, office desks. Uh, but I believe that boulevard model, uh, whether it is MLK Grand or a new alignment, is, is, the, is the model that we want to seek. And remember that in this same area, we have at least the opportunity and probably the mandate to accommodate a high-speed rail line on the Southern Pacific Rail Alignment and perhaps, I hope, and the committee recommends, a light rail segment between the, uh, the convention center area uh, and the, south, uh, the southbound line uh, on into the southern neighborhoods of the city of Portland and into Clackamas County. So we have to put a lot of transportation into this corridor. It therefore has a lot of opportunities and probably requires more land than the MLK Grand Couplet now occupies. Uh, Ernie Bonner, not a member of City Club, but a member of Riverfront for People. Um, you mentioned, assuming that the City Council would agree with you, not to do the Water Avenue ramp, and certainly if the city would agree to the larger vision that you cast, um, the next and most important step is the region, where really these major transportation decisions are ultimately, ultimately made. And you indicated that maybe it would be possible for the city to have some effect on the region, which I have not found to be that great in the past. Do you have some reason to think, or do you have some particular examples or some particular reason to suspect that the region might be willing to go along with the city in this kind of vision? I do, and, and it is easy, I think, for those of us who live in the city and who have the city's values about livability and neighborhood planning and transportation to, to sneer at the suburbs and say they'll never get it. Um, and I don't believe that that's the case. I think there are people in Clackamas County uh, in, in the city of Beaverton, on the Metro Council, in Lake Oswego, and other municipalities around the region who share this understanding and who want, or, and who, like we are, are impatient to get to that different transportation future. Look at what Clackamas County, a place I have criticized often about its land use planning, particularly the exception areas outside of the urban growth boundary, look at what they have done with this transit-oriented neighborhood that they have designed on Sunnyside Road. If you haven't seen that project, take a look at it. They did the difficult work of bringing all those property owners together and bringing in Peter Calthorpe, one of the foremost urban designers in the country, and creating a beautiful plan that they're now issuing permits for. They're actually building the thing. So here, Clackamas County is in some ways ahead of the city of Portland. And I think that's great, and we'll try to catch up. 
So the region should not be written off. I believe that the people at the table at the Joint Policy Advisory Committee on Transportation and on the, and on the Metro Council and around the region will, will join us, at least a majority of them will, in trying to accelerate this change. Because if they don't, we're sunk. I'm Ray Polani, a City Club member. Commissioner Hales, uh, you pointed out that the Water Avenue ramp is only the first of three ramps which will require probably up to a quarter billion dollar investment on the existing East Bank Freeway. Uh, there obviously is where the money is for the alternatives. Now, assuming that this city council votes against the Water Avenue ramp, will it also have the guts to require Metro to carry forward a light rail east side connector for the north-south rail line in addition to the downtown alignment which they are prepared to carry forward? Based on what I've seen so far and on the committee's recommendation as well, I believe we should have a light rail alignment along the central east side, either in addition to or as the main component of the south-north line. And in fact, that is a position that is supported by the Southeast Uplift Neighborhood Coalition, which also supports the rest of this committee's recommendations, again, as I do, with the exception of the Water Avenue ramp narrow vote, they also agree that we should remove the ramp. So there's neighborhood support for ensuring that there's real light rail service on the east side and that it isn't bypassed by the design of the system. The problem is that the, the Metro staff is still continuing to recommend against it. Well, the recommendations are one thing, final decisions are another. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Hales, looks like I get a chance to ask my second question that I wanted to ask you. In light of the economic vibrancy of that uh, near Central East Side area, um, it's everything in our benefit to keep that economically vibrant. What would you offer the business owners in that area in the short run to mitigate moving freight and people in and out of that area if we don't build Water Avenue? And what would you offer in the long run as access to I-5 South? Because a north-south boulevard will connect easily to I-5 North, but how would you access I-5 South? I think what we, one of the things that we need to offer the Central East Side business owners and investment, uh, people who have invested in that area, is some certainty. And that's why I believe the committee's recommendation that the industrial sanctuary designation between 1st and 12th, now it goes from the, almost the river's edge, water to 12th, that that designation be maintained and that they know that that really will be an industrial sanctuary and that we stand by that policy in the Central City Plan and in our own comprehensive plan. And there's a real fear there in the Central East Side that all, that all of this is just a step-by-step -step gentrification uh, to make loft housing and Starbucks coffee stores out of what is now a viable employment area. And that fear needs to be addressed. But the solution, the way to provide certainty is not through your transportation system. It's to do the land use designations and stick by them. But again, we have so often in the past based investment decisions and, and many of the other uh, dynamics in the marketplace have been based on what does the transportation system look like? Oh yeah, we've got to go check on the zoning, but, but how do you get there and, and what is the freeway access? What we're trying to do is change that to say, no, what you rely on is the zoning and then what we must do as policymakers is support that. There's some other short-term changes, everything from traffic management uh, to, to other local improvements that we could do in that area. And again, what we've requested that the state do with that $20 million is put it on the table for alternative projects in that area and elsewhere and possibly for another southbound access. There are a couple of other ways to do that. We've seen recommendations to this committee of different alignments, different ways to get southbound access. One would be a ramp off of the MLK Grand Couplet right at Sullivan's Gulch. The other uh, idea is to make improvements to the west end of the Ross Island Bridge and a better connection from the Central East Side Industrial District to Powell so that you go south to get south on I-5. So there's, and, and the uh, third possibility is the Markham Bridge itself. The committee has not recommended, and I don't see a feasible strategy for removing the Markham Bridge, even if that were a good idea. So there, uh, granted, we've got to get up into the air to do it, but there are ramp configurations that could get you directly from that boulevard or from the south end of the district up onto the Markham Bridge. So those are three.
Charlie, Steve Shell, member. Um, I commend you for your dream. Uh, I think it's a very, very uh, bold step that you've taken in terms of presenting this uh, situation to us and to the city. I guess I'd like to ask you to dream a little more. Um, you've described this boulevard and you've said you, you're not an architect or a, an urban designer. Um, but I, I think in order to see where this ultimately leads, we need to see what the, what the benchmarks are really going to be uh, in terms of a change proposed here. For example, how does it affect the bridges? We're talking about width of this thing. How wide is it going to be, this boulevard that you're proposing? How, in fact, are people going to get out of Produce Row and up onto this uh, boulevard? I mean, uh, and, and you've made some comments about the MLK uh, grand couplet. Um, I was just running through numbers in my head. I'm talking uh, 200 feet or more in a width of this swath that's going to cut through that. Can you dream a little bit more for us, recognizing that we won't hold you accountable if it doesn't quite come out that way? Well, gee, Steve, there are plenty of people in this town right now who wish I'd dream a little less. <laughs> um, but, but let me take a shot at that for a minute. Um, I, I brought with me today, and obviously our, our radio audience can't see it, but those of you who are here can, a 1956 or 1957 artist's rendering of the freeway system as then planned for the central city. And it's interesting to look at. Some of it was actually built, like Harbor Drive. Some of the other proposals, like the infamous Ash Street ramps that were to connect to Harbor Drive, were stopped just in time uh, in that era. Um, the point that I'm trying to make is that there really are, thanks to the, the feats of engineering uh, that are available to us, a lot of options. Uh, one of the questions is, do the bridge structures, the city and county bridge structures for the Hawthorne Bridge and the, uh, and, and the Morrison Bridge, have to be elevated as far into the district as they are now if the freeway is not there and if something different is done with the railroad right away? Uh, that option exists. Um, at least theoretically. Um, I think there are a variety of ways that you could configure that boulevard, perhaps by taking out a full block, granted that, that it may require that depending on which way it's done, uh, that then provide all kinds of ways in the margin of that boulevard to connect to the bridges. Notice, by the way, the little, the little ramp that gets you from Water Avenue up onto the Hawthorne Bridge. It is possible, even with the bridge structures where they are now, uh, to access the, the western edge of that area without enormous structures, as long as they're getting up onto the existing bridges. So I think, uh, I think we can dream a lot there, and, and again, ground that dream in both the reality that we are avoiding an expenditure of millions of dollars, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, if we create a viable alternative to the freeway for local traffic in that area. So that, you know, that's the principle to remember here is that, granted, we don't have that whole $200 million awaiting us as a blank check, but we are foregoing a lot of expenditures. And when you look at that rendering of what might have been based on the dreams in the 1950s, realize how much of that was built and unbuilt in the time since, a lot can happen in 25 years. Jack Fisher, I'm a member. Um, just hope maybe you could comment briefly on, we've been talking locally, what the, what the effect of this is going to be on the, on the north-south through traffic and the, what I would anticipate the resulting increase in traffic on 405 and 205, which seem to be fairly crowded most of the time now. Thanks. Well, f there are a couple of first principles here. One is that I believe that it is a mistake to build interstate freeways in the heart of cities. <laughs> and as Ted mentioned, we replicated that mistake all over the country. The interstate freeway system was sold to us on the grounds of interstate commerce and national defense. It was not sold to us as a great way to get commuters to and from suburbs. That's the way it worked out in practice. We're finding out, of course, that it is not possible financially to perpetuate that or to sustain that very long. So if you, if you believe that the freeway system is going to continue to be needed for more and more local uses, this is going to be much more difficult than it is if, if we're trying to get the freeway system back to its original intent. I, I know we're still going to have freeways and we're still going to have cars, but if our local circulation is by surface streets and transit, we don't need as an extensive a freeway system. I'm Don Sterling, a member of the City Club. 
Charlie, I could try to turn this into a question with a don't you think or something on the end, but <laughs> I, I do think this is relevant. Uh, would you describe to the club the plans that another civic committee have developed for the East Bank Esplanade, whether or not the freeway is removed? The East Side Esplanade, thank you, Don, is a, is a design that has been produced for us uh, under, the, under the leadership of the city's Parks Bureau and the Portland Development Commission for a set of improvements, public space, uh, market sheds, perhaps a marina, uh, and, and pedestrian and bicycle circulation along the East Bank as it now stands. That set of improvements will work if the freeway is still there. Um, to my opinion, that they won't work very well, but they will work. Uh, the committee tried to design that set of improvements, and I think they succeeded, so that they would also work if the freeway wasn't there, and that those public spaces along the ribbon of the water's edge itself would integrate with a different kind of development and environment between First Avenue and the river. So I think that proposal is a keeper. It needs some modification, but I think it's a keeper regardless of whether this committee's uh, work is accepted and put into action or not. Aloha Shade City Club member, you haven't spoken about the impact on air pollution of this new proposal and how it would relate to the federal standards that are coming up. That's a good question because if we force people to take longer trips by the road system that we build and if they're going to still take those trips anyway, you could actually make the situation worse by removing the freeway. And we have to face that as we, as we look at different designs. Uh, but again, it's my thesis that if we keep facilitating more and more automobile use, and that's what all three of these designs that the state now has for this area, the Water Avenue ramp, the McLaughlin ramps, and particularly the, the, the so-called improvements along the area next to the arena will do, is just facilitate a bigger and bigger freeway system. I believe that that will do much to harm the region's air quality. And again, the only way to get off this merry-go-round is at some place to say, we're going to hold the size of the urban freeway system where it is now and put our energy and our planning and our dollars into the alternatives. And with the understanding that if we do that right, we reduce average vehicle use and therefore reduce air pollution. Charlie, I'm going to just add a comment, not a question. <laughs> I spent some time talking with this Kim McCall member. I spent some time talking with Glenn Jackson about this whole thing some years ago, and he admitted that the decision to build the Markham Bridge the way it was and to create the most dangerous curve in Oregon was a financial one, that they would be much cheaper to take the fill land along the river and curve it around and, uh, of course, everything was asphalt instead of concrete. That was cheaper, too. But uh, Terry Schrunk did his level best, as did Orman Bean, commissioner, to get him to move that freeway back. It was fought specifically by the Southern Pacific Railroad, by Holman, uh, and several other companies along there. They did not want it, even cantilevering out over the tracks. They didn't want that either. Hmm. So you can see there was a financial consideration there. They took the cheap, we took the cheapest route. And uh, Schrunk tried his very best. Uh, the record is full of it, so I thought that ah, might be. Ah, that is interesting, and of and course we often the, do take the cheapest route, you know. So that's right. Well, and of course the effect, as I said, with this sort of uh, loss leader approach in these transportation projects, is that sometimes when you take the cheap route the first time, it makes the additions more and more expensive. The Water Avenue ramp, if it were built, would cost twenty million dollars because it has to come up off of Water Avenue with two ramps that are then joined, turn north in front of promotion products, gaining altitude the whole time, take a 180 degree turn out over the freeway and the river, sweep back along the east bank and climb up to the Markham Bridge. You talk about going about around your elbow to get to your thumb. The, the, the reason we have to do that is not because the engineers love concrete, though some pro people probably would make that argument as well, but because when you've got the freeway right on the river bank, you have enormously complicated the process of getting to the river side of the freeway. So what would have been a three or four or five million dollar ramp somewhere else is a twenty million dollar ramp because the cheap decision was made the first time. You probably recall the, the conversation that Orman Bean had also with his grandson, Terry, uh, when, when he was looking out of his window, Terry told me this story, uh, at the freeway under construction and shook his head, and Terry remembers this and recounted it to me and said, boy, that's a mistake. Someday that land along the river there is going to be worth a fortune. 
Commissioner, if I may, I'm, I'm going to ask another question. Uh, we have been focusing on one of the aspects of the automobile dependence and denial, and that is the, the freeways and roads. What about the parking situation? Uh, obviously, that is the other very important component. Uh, is the city, and most of all, really, is the region prepared to deal with the question of, of parking, as we have dealt maybe in downtown Portland with the lid? Are we prepared to have that area wide, and maybe are we prepared to start charging for parking? Well, obviously we are in the central city, uh, and that I think is a tougher question for the region than are we ready to start switching to alternate kinds of projects in our transportation investments, because there you're talking even more theologically about the, the American right to own an automobile, drive it wherever you want, and park free in enormous parking lots. Um, and that's going to be even harder for people to give up than the notion that you ought to be able to get anywhere on a freeway. And I, I hope that the region will get to that belief because I don't think we can manage transportation in the region without some restriction on uh, the now free availability of parking. And we can't do it just by constricting the number of spaces in a region that's this large. Um, I, I saw not long ago, in fact it was only three years ago, that the city of Beaverton increased its standards and its development code uh, for apartment buildings from one and a half spaces to two spaces per unit. They were going the wrong way as recently as three years ago. So that, those kinds of details in local transportation and development policy are going to have to change in concert with all the rest of this. Thank you all very much. I think, Commissioner Hales, the size of the audience today and the warm reception leads me to conclude that we might all hope that your vision of the future becomes indeed that and not a figment of your imagination. So we're adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>